this lecture, uh, along with the one that was provided by Miles Allen on Tuesday, is, as well as the audience here, it's being live streamed. So we're expecting that there is some audience. We're not quite, it's an experiment, so we're not quite sure how many, uh, but, but in various countries. I know there's, there's people watching this in Peru and Brazil and uh, Africa and elsewhere as well, possibly. So uh, and they may well be tweeting in questions. Let's, let's, let's see how, how, that, how that works. Uh, let me hit the lights. Okay, uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm uh, Yadvinder Mali. I'm Professor of Ecosystem Science in this department and also run the Ecosystems uh, uh, Research Program. And, uh, uh, and I'll be to the MSc class, I'll be lecturing this term on, on the Global Change and the Biosphere module. So this is a one particular perspective on that. And uh, uh, many of you uh, will have become familiar with images uh, such as this. Let me just see if I can have the lights a bit lower. Is that okay for lighting? Uh, uh, images uh, which show, uh, this, this is the, the famous black marble image now that shows the Earth from space and, uh, uh, and show also shows the night lights of human activity in, in cities in, in particular. And I think uh, this is one of the images that manages to transform ideas that we know intellectually that were a major force of change on the planet into something that we know intuitively, that looking at this image, we see that on this, the, this planet, although it is vast, it is finite in size, and that human presence on the planet is pervasive in, in, uh, 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 around the world, and so to the extent that we are a significant uh, agent of change and modification of, of the planet as a whole. And uh, this is what's been uh, uh, well, one of the memes, the cultural memes that, that's come around. This is the idea that we're entering a new geological age, the Anthropocene, the age of humans. And uh, uh, there are uh, uh, just, just, just this week, there's a meeting of the International Stratigraphical Union in, in Berlin to, to discuss the, the formal geological definition of the Anthropocene and uh, how you can define it and where it could possibly begin and whether to even accept it as a formal geological uh, concept. There's an article in The Guardian today uh, on that. Uh, uh, Sorry, I think we have an adapter here. Oh, this one? Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, and, uh, 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 but I, I would argue that uh, independent of that geological definition of, of the Anthropocene, it's, uh, it's become much more powerful than that. It's become a cultural meme and it captures this concept that we are large relative to the natural biogeochemical uh, bio and, and ecophysiological processes of the planet, that we are a significant agent in the processes and the, and the earth system cycling uh, of the planet. So what? Uh, 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 and, and it isn't just about climate change. If we solved climate change tomorrow with some uh, pollution-free source of energy, we'd still be hitting many of the other challenges of the Anthropocene in terms of our land use, in terms of our waste production, in terms of acquiring the resources we need to, uh, uh, to feed ourselves and, and to, to power ourselves. Uh, and so it's, it's a much wider concept than just uh, climate change. And in this lecture, I'm going to explore one perspective on the Anthropocene, one particular lens, which is to take uh, the, the concept of metabolism, which I'll explain in a moment, and to see, explore how human metabolism throughout human history has varied in comparison to, to, the, to the natural metabolism of the land biosphere. And that's a concept that we're going to play with and, and explore uh, in this lecture. And uh, uh, a key feature of, of the Anthropocene is not only how active we are, but how interconnected we are through our telecommunications or through physical travel or through the transport or, of goods. And uh, sometimes uh, when you see these images, uh, the, the metaphor is employed that humanity is a superorganism, that uh, as well as our individual selves, our societies and groups of societies form a, a larger collective organism that's emerging on the face of the planet. And uh, to some extent that, that's possible as a metaphor, but I, I'm going to actually explore some of the, 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 the concept from a slightly different metabolic lens. To what extent can global humanity be seen as a collection, as a termite's nest of of, of, of a vast number of individual organisms working, working collectively. And we'll explore some of the ideas around that in, in the later half of this uh, lecture. So to turn to the, the concepts that I'm going to use, they, they're around this idea of uh, metabolism. Now, all creatures, whether, whether animals or, or plants, have a biological metabolism. We're all using energy to power our basic biologies. Plants do that, animals do that, bacteria uh, do that. 
And uh, about the same time, uh, there's a concept that, that's emerged from this, this field of industrial ecology of uh, the social or the embodied metabolism that as, as humans in particular have a, an energy use that's much wider than their indi individual biological use. Uh, and, uh, and, this can, uh, and that involves uh, the use of energy supply, uh, the acquiring of resources which ultimately end up as food or even domesticating other creatures. Uh, to, to, and their metabolism for, for our purpose. And uh, this has been proposed or uh, termed the social or the embodied metabolism or the, sometimes the extended metabolism of, uh, of, of uh, creatures and then particularly of humans. And uh, so the, the metabolism is the rate at which energy is exchanged between an organism and its environment, transformed within an organism and allocated to its maintenance, growth and re reproduction. So that's the basic biological definition. And we can define a, a social metabolism as the rate at which energy is exchanged between a society and its environment and transformed within that society. So we're taking this analogy that the, treating a society or, a, or an individual in the society as more than simply their, their, their biological metabolism, but a, a larger funnel of energy uh, for, for the activities that, 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 that individual does in society. And uh, well, well, I'll, I'll, in this lecture, I'll jump uh, and, and a few little asides, and, and one now that will become apparent later while we're doing this is to look at how metabolism scales in animals. And uh, uh, it's one of the few laws in ecology, or I wouldn't say a law, but a clear patterns in, in, in ecology is around how the metabolism of animals or organisms scales uh, uh, with size, that uh, larger creatures have a, a, a a larger mam a metabolism, but actually it doesn't scale, scale proportionately. If you're a thousand times larger, if an elephant is a thousand times larger than a, than a small mammal, it, its metabolism isn't quite a thousand times larger. The, and the, the scaling law is body mass to the three quarters generally. And this has been termed Cl C Kleiber's law. And uh, just, to, just to explain how these scaling laws work, uh, if we, can, we can use something which is termed a power law. So the metabolism of an organism is some constant times the mass of the organism to the power of some scaling coefficient alpha. And if we do some simple maths on that and just take logarithms of that, you'd see that uh, the logarithm of the metabolism is a constant, the logarithm of K, plus the scaling coefficient alpha times the logarithm of uh, the mass. So if you did a, a simple linear, uh, a simple plot of the logarithm of <laughs> metabolism versus the logarithm of mass, if there's a simple power law, you'd expect a straight line through the data with a slope <coughs> alpha and an intercept being th th this constant log k. And uh, what, what Kleiber pointed out uh, uh, a half a century ago is that this is what you, what you find in the data. If you plot the log of metabolic rate measured for different organisms against the mass, you tend to find these straight lines with different intercepts that are jumping up and down depending on the class of organism, whether they're cold-blooded or warm-blooded or unicellular, but, but overall the slope is around three quarters. This is how metabolism in individual organisms seems to scale with size. And there's a whole field of metabolic ecology that tries to explain this. Uh, uh, James Brown in, and uh, Jeff West in particular have been pioneers of this in terms of networks and fractal networks and how the distribution of uh, whether it's blood through a mammal or, or, or sap through a plant uh, uh, follows ne uh, there's this fra these fractal rules which aren't quite the same and that's why you get this three quarters rule in, in scaling rather than a simple one on one scaling of metabolism. And uh, so the consequence of this is that the, the as we said the biology of whole organisms scales as body mass to the three quarters to typically and if we divide that uh, to get the bio, bio the the, me the metabolism per unit mass, so just divide that by m, we find that the, the metabolism per unit mass tends to scale as m to the minus a quarter. So per unit mass uh, of elephant has, has less metabolism than per unit mass of mouse. Uh, and many processes in biology, uh, we can think of heartbeat or reproduction rate, tend to, uh, uh, that are rate-based, tend to follow this pattern, that they, they scale as mass to the minus a quarter. So an elephant uh, has a slower heartbeat uh, th th than, a, than a mouse, for, for example. And uh, whereas uh, many things that are the inverse of rates that are times, uh, like lifetime uh, or gestation time or how long food, the gut residence time, how long food sits in your body, tends to be the inverse of that and follow as 
mass to, to the one quarter uh, as the inverse of the rate. And uh, so there are interesting consequences of these scaling patterns. So uh, how many heartbeats are there in a lifetime of an animal? The answer is more or less a billion, uh, whatever the size of the animal. And, and the reason that emerges is that the number of heartbeats in a lifetime is the heartbeat rate uh, times the lifetime. And as we've shown here, the rates tend to scale as m uh, to, to the minus quarter. The lifetime tends to scale as m to the quarter. So when you multiply them, you get m to the zero, which is a constant. So uh, the, one of the interesting things that emerges is that almost all creatures, independent of body size, the heartbeat, the total number of heartbeats they have in their lifetime on average is, uh, is, is constant, whether you're a mouse or an elephant. And uh, one of the units that we use in, a, in, in this sort of metabolic theory uh, is, is the, unit, the unit of energy, the watts, the amount of joules per second passing through metabolism. And uh, uh, an old-fashioned tungsten light bulb has, has about 60 watts as, as its energy usage. Uh, and so uh, the, the average uh, meta metabolic rate of most of you in this room is around 120 watts. So about the power, at this moment you are powering yourself to the equivalent power of having two tungsten light bulbs lit, lit up inside you. That's, that's the chemical energy, the metabolism, that's, that, that's powering your activities uh, at the moment. And, uh, uh, and, the, the, and this pattern of scaling seems to exist through various levels of biology. So if you look uh, on the top left, this is, this is quite similar to uh, 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 what I've shown previously. If you look at many animals uh, on, on this log-log scale, uh, the metabolism of those animals, uh, whether they're birds or mammals, uh, scales to body mass. Uh, but if you go to a, a, a finer scale uh, on, on the right, where you're looking at cells and mitochondria and within cells and respiratory enzymes, even within the cell, you seem, you seem to find the same scaling, three quarters scaling rules. And even perhaps even going down uh, uh, to, to the level of genome length, you find these quarter law scaling rules. And uh, in terms of this is the inverse, the evidence, if you look at heart rate and beats per minute, you see this m to the minus quarter uh, scaling rule. So there's a lot of evidence that these patterns are quite general uh, across biology. And uh, uh, one proxy for metabolism, but not an entirely accurate one, is growth rate of an organism. And uh, if you plot the growth rate of an organism in terms of grams of growth per day against its mass, on logarithmic scales, you see differences. You see that generally mammals, which are the open circles here, have a higher growth rate than, uh, uh, than reptiles, which, is the, which are the triangles below, but they have a similar slope. They still, they both follow this uh, uh, pow power, uh, this, these scaling rules, but with a different offset. So mammal, mammals being warm-blooded organisms tend to be able to, for a similar mass, produce much more energy and have a much higher metabolism. Uh, than, than a reptile of a similar mass. And that's the key advantage that mammals have over, over reptiles, being able to maintain very high metabolic activity through their high temperatures. Uh, primates, interestingly, fall off that curve. And, th and those are, the, uh, uh, th those are the, uh, the, the black squares there. And, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, but, but I showed you earlier on that, that when we looked at total metabolism uh, for primates, it did stay on, on the same curve as other mammals. And yet when we look at growth rates in primates, we see them deviating on so to the extent that the growth rate of a human is actually the same as the growth rate of an equivalent mass reptile rather than an equivalent mass mammal. Uh, so we're very slow growing creatures and we, we grow at the rate of boa constrictors uh, rather than at the rate of gorillas for, for uh, well, uh, uh, as gorillas rather than the rate of a, a deer of our equivalent mass. Now can anybody tell me why humans given that the metabolic rate scales are the same as other mammals, why don't we invest so much in growth as other mammals do? Probably said I had brains, yes. That's it. We have very expensive brains. And this is the key thing with, with primates over time. Their brains, as their brain size grew, uh, as an evolutionary innovation, uh, more and more of the energy is diverted to maintaining these, these brains. So in the case of humans, about 20% of our energy is used to maintain our brain activity, and that's energy that can't be expended in building biomass for growth. And, uh, and this is why uh, our growth rates are, are much, much smaller than, than, we'd, than we'd expect for, for our body size. But our total metabolism is consistent. It's just that much more of it is used in just keeping the brain machinery functioning. So once we go beyond the level of uh, individual uh, organisms, uh, we can start asking questions about how societies scale uh, uh, with, uh, um, uh, uh, with, with uh, 
uh, body size or, or mass of, of societies. And before moving into human societies, we can look at the other big societies in the biological world, which are the, su the, super the eusocial insects, the ants and the termites, uh, uh, you know, which, which, which really pioneered the, the, this, this, uh, these very large-scale societies and complex societies of complex interactions. And just to give an example of the size of these societies, this is a, a photo from Brazil where researchers poured uh, concrete into the nest of leafcutter ants and then, and then so, so, so solidified the nest and then excavated it to show the size of this, this, this underground ant city uh, 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 and the scale of it. So, and uh, ants, as well as pioneering these large societies, they also pioneered, far pioneered farming. So these ants, uh, their major mode of, sub of subsistence is to collect uh, leaves, bring them to their nest, grow fungi on the farm the, the, the fungi essentially and eat the fungi and feed them to the young. So, so they were the first agriculturalists as well. So agriculture wasn't something that appeared on earth 10,000 years ago. It appeared much lower before that in, in ant societies and also in termite societies, some sort of termites. And uh, so uh, to, to, to the extent that, uh, uh, that uh, Ed, Ed Wilson, the famous biologist, has, has argued that there are two dominant types of organism on Earth. There are the eusocial insects and there are the, 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 the eusocial primates, which are humans. Uh, and, uh, and if you look in terms of total body mass on Earth, you see that uh, the total body mass of humans is around 300 million tons on, on the planet. And if we include our associated domesticated animals that support, uh, support us, that, that goes up to about 1,000 million tons uh, in terms of total biological mass, which is on, the sa is on the same order of magnitude as termites on the planet and probably less than the total biomass of ants on the planet. So in terms of biological mass, these are, these are organisms. Of course, of course, in the termites and ants, it's spread across many different species, but these are the organisms that, that dominate in, in, in terms of to total mass on, on the planet. And so how does metabolism scale in, uh, in these societies? Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, th there's been some interesting work. Uh, uh, in particular around termite, uh, uh, termite colonies and also to some extent in ant colonies. And uh, this study shows it, for example, where they, they measure the metabolic rate to, through the energy, the heat output of different uh, uh, insect colonies uh, in uh, individual insects. So in red, you see the, met the, metabo the metabolism of individual insects of different mass varying by four orders of magnitude from very tiny insects to, to very large individual insects. And you see that that they get a, a power coefficient of around uh, 0.83. So, so close to this three quarters rule give, given the, the noise in the, in, the, in the data set. And then they also did measurements on colonies of uh, termites uh, of different sizes and found that uh, you find the same scaling pattern uh, in, in the termites. It's this three quarter, quarter scaling rule. So a colony of termites is like, in terms of metabolism, is like a t an individual termite of the same size. Uh, so, so there is this con continuity in scaling between the individuals and the groups of, of individuals in, the, in this social, uh, 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 in this uh, 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 social society, and that means that per individual termite for the same mass, uh, there's less activity going on. The larger the society, the less active the individual termite is. And, and it's interesting to wonder why that is. Are there, are, there, are there scalings of efficiency? When you have a society stratified with many different tasks going on, does it mean that any individual uh, termite does, has to do less? There's a particular role in that society or less movement in the day rather than an individual foraging insect that has to do a lot in a day. But for whatever reason, individual animals, are the, when, they, when they join a, a, a larger society, slow down in the proportional amount of activity done by that animal. And overall, that means that the the metabolism of the society doesn't scale uniformly with the number of individuals in the society, but as a three-quarters power of the number of individuals in that society. And we'll come back to these when we look at human societies later on. So this is why those of you who have no interest in, 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 in insect ecology will, 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 uh, should, uh, will see why, why this is relevant to the discussions we have later. So one question I want to explore in this is to what extent is hum can humanity be considered this megafaunal superorganism? half ape uh, and half ant, uh, large in our size and our ability to influence, but also hypersocial uh, in our structures and to some extent there's uh, more than our individual selves as, as this hypersocial society. And there's some evidence that we, uh, we can see scaling uh, patterns in, in, in society and, and, uh, 
uh, they pop up almost everywhere you look at these, these three-quarter scaling rules. And here's just one example, uh, at a, at a, not at an equivalent scale, where you look at per capita energy consumption in a country versus its per capita GDP. And surprise, surprise, the, the slope, the power law slope of that, that line is, two, is three quarters uh, uh, on average. But, but you can see there's a lot of variation within there. So there is inter-societal and political and structural variation, but the broad pattern uh, follows the, these three quarters uh, scaling rules. So before returning to, to, to these scaling rules, I want to now take a, go in a different direction and look at how humanity got to where we are uh, in, in terms of uh, metabolic transition. So this, is, this brings in this idea of social metabolic regimes in human history and that there being distinct transitions from uh, w one part of human history uh, to another. So from being a society of hunter-gatherer primates, how did we end up being this complex uh, city-dwelling, highly interconnected uh, society of, of, of the modern world? And, uh, in, in, uh, overall, in, in human history, the steady change from, from being a hunter-gatherer to, to being a modern uh, 21st century human uh, has been punctuated by two major transitions and revolutions that we'll explore. One is the Neolithic Revolution that began around 10,000 years ago uh, after the end of the Ice Ages, where there was a shift to agriculture in various societies. And the second was the Industrial Revolution that began uh, in the late 18th century and that, that there was still in some ways, in the midst of that, in that industrial uh, transition. So we'll look at both of those over time. So let's go back first to this uh, uh, hunter-gatherer uh, lifestyle and just look at approximately the, the metabolics of, of, of hunter-gatherers. And uh, as I said earlier, the metabolism of an individual human is around 120 watts, so about two light bulbs, of, uh, or tungsten light bulbs of energy uh, uh, flowing, uh, flowing through the, the individual. However, if you look at uh, the extended metabolism of a hunter-gatherer, it is more than that because in, there are inefficiencies in acquiring food resources uh, and uh, also there's use of fire uh, and other aspects as well. But overall, the, the basic lifestyle mode of a hunter-gatherer is uh, to be able to cream off what is edible and consumable in the natural ecosystem around, which is very little often. It's a few grains, a few fruits, a few nuts, uh, maybe some tubers. There's very little in a natural ecosystem that is immediately edible to, to, to uh, to, to most to, to humans uh, d directly without any form of major processing, and uh, and so that this that this ultimately acts as a major constraint on how many humans can be supported on an area of land, and so the typical um, capacity population density of a hunter gatherer population is around 0.1 person per square kilometer, so so one person for every uh, 10 square kilometers. That, that's a typical population density manageable by a hunter-gatherer society. There's, a, there's variation in that depending on what the resources are, but that, that's an average. And so therefore, if we take this extended metabolism of 300 watts and multiply it by this population density, the metabolism per unit area for a hunter-gatherer society is on the order of 30 <coughs> watts per square kilometer. So a low power light bulb per, per, per square kilometer is a total energy flowing through a hunter-gatherer society. Uh, uh, incidentally, many of these uh, things are, are in a book, many of the figures and the arguments are in this book chapter, which uh, is available uh, online on my website, or, uh, or where you can buy the, uh, it's part of a book called Is the Planet Full, which is available in Blackwell's. Uh, and, uh, uh, but if, so if we compare this human metabolism of around 30 watts per square kilometer, we, we can also uh, calculate the natural metabolism of a tropical savanna, the environment in which we evolved. And by knowing the, the productivity of the savanna and converting those carbon units into energy units, uh, uh, which is quite straightforward to do, that the metabolism of a tropical savanna is around 30 megawatts per square kilometer. That's the amount of biological energy flowing through a tropical savanna. And so therefore this says that the early human metabolism is on the order of 0.0001% of the metabolism of the, uh, of the, the, the savanna. And uh, so it's a fairly minor player in terms of the metabolism of that, of that uh, ecosystem. And it doesn't mean we didn't alter it and, and affect uh, uh, that ecosystem in big ways. Uh, the, there's evidence that fire management by humans uh, for the last million years has altered the nature and ecology of savannas. And, uh, uh, and also, the, in many cases around the world, and this is something uh, that we picked up later this term, the extinction of large creatures 
by early humans may have had a major effect on ecosystem structure and ecosystem uh, functioning. So humans, early humans certainly had an effect on the ecosystem, but in terms of overall uh, uh, comparison of their metabolism compared to, to the ecosystem, it was small. And this matters, uh, uh, what I'm using here in metabolism is not only uh, how much energy is flowing through, but it's our capacity to alter the environment around us. If we have a lot of energy flowing through us, we have, we have, we have an ability to to make fundamental transformations of the, uh, the environment around us. We have lots of spare energy. If there's very little energy flowing through, uh, the, the natural energy, the capacity to rebound of the environment from, dis uh, of, uh, from disturbances is much higher than our capacity to alter that, that environment in big ways. So it gives an idea of how much we're able to transform the, phys the, the biological environment around us compared to uh, its natural state. And so th uh, this hunter-gatherer lifestyle began to change around uh, 10,000 years ago with the transition first in the Fertile Crescent in the central Eurasia uh, uh, but, but later on uh, in many places around the world through the, Agri the Neolithic Revolution. And uh, there were many centers of the origin of food production, independent centers in many cases. So this, uh, and they, they, they seem to all occur in the Holocene. So at the end of the last ice ages when the climate warmed and stabilized uh, uh, that all around the world we see this transition to agriculture popping up. Um, certainly in some cases, such as the connection between the Americas and Eurasia, there was almost no, there's very little, like, unlikely there was any, any communication connection between these cultures. It was independent originations of agriculture in multiple places. And that says that at, there was something ripe in the system for agriculture to originate. And you know, one argument is that human society had become sufficiently complex through the use of language in the preceding ice age but it required the stability of an interglacial to be able to successfully make a transition from hunter-gathering to, to successful farming. But there was something in, inherent, the fact that agriculture was essentially nucleating in different places around the world at the start of the Holocene suggests there was something inevitable about the origin of agriculture at that time, once the language or societal complexity had reached a, a, a sufficient stage. And the interesting thing about agriculture uh, and one way of looking at it is that it's a colonization of ecosystems that rather than just creaming off what the ecosystem can provide us in terms of edible fruit or nuts, which is a very limited amount, we transform the ecosystem into something that's much more edible, much more consumable, much more productive, targeted towards our, our, our consumption needs. And, uh, uh, and this is the, 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 the essence of why the agricultural revolution uh, can, can dominate over hunter-gatherer lifestyles. There's a lot of evidence that the early agricultural re revolution didn't improve uh, the, the well-being of individual humans in those societies. There's a lot of evidence that suddenly packing humans together into uh, s s small villages with poor sanitation, decreased lifespan, decreased health of individual humans in that transition. But those societies could support many more pop people in a smaller area than the surrounding hunter-gatherer societies and therefore outcompete them. And uh, so if we, uh, uh, but one other feature of agriculture is that the, the ultimate source of energy is land. And uh, overall, uh, 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 there can be innovations over time, but fundamentally the ultimate source of energy available to a society is the area of land available to that society. You can have increases in efficiency over time, but <laughs> ultimately you hit these barriers of how much land does your society uh, own compared to neighboring societies. And, uh, and so there, there is a potential of a fundamental limit in, uh, in the metabolism of agricultural, purely agricultural societies. So if we now jump forward in time to the 17th century in Europe, uh, at the cusp of, a, of the Industrial Revolution, we can look at a, uh, the typical metabolism, social metabolism of an agricultural society. And this is, these are data in this case from Austria around 1700. Uh, but uh, the, uh, they apply to many European societies and many, many other societies in, in broad magnitude. So the, ag the extended metabolism of, a, of an ag uh, somebody living in an agricultural society, pre-industrial, is around 2,000 watts per person. So much larger, an order of magnitude larger than the extended metabolism of a hunter-gatherer. And that's because they've uh, colonized the surrounding ecosystem, are directly uh, using that ecosystem, transforming that ecosystem to provide uh, uh, energy and food uh, uh, for themselves. And also they may have uh, uh, colonized animals, domesticates, cows, uh, sheep, cattle, uh, chickens, uh, and, uh, and transform the, the, these creatures into, uh, into having a primary purpose of providing either, uh, either energy or 
food to, to, to humans. And so the, these societies can support a much higher uh, population density, a typical uh, population density of, an of a pre-industrial agricultural society would be around 40 persons uh, per square kilometer. And so if we multiply that extended metabolism by the population density, we come up with a, with a, uh, a social metabolism of around 80 kilowatts per square kilometer. And if we compare that to the metabolism of a temperate forest, where, which, which would have been the natural ecosystem uh, uh, where these uh, agricultural, th this ex European agricultural society uh, uh, re re replaced, this is about 5% of the natural ecosystem metabolism. So it's beginning to become significant. It's beginning to be able to transform uh, these societies, uh, the, these natural uh, biomes to a substantial extent, but it's still, still an order of magnitude smaller than, than, than the natural energy uh, flowing through that system. And uh, 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 we can look at this over time. And uh, uh, last year I read a book by, by a popular historian called Ian Morris, which is, has a terrible name, Why the West Rules for Now. But actually, once you get past the name, it has some very interesting insights and a lot of de detail into the, econo the energy flows through different societies. Uh, uh, over time throughout human history uh, based on quite a lot of meticulous research into uh, in, into records and what, what is available in information uh, and some assumptions in there is true so if you and he focuses in this book on uh, uh, on uh, Eurasia and in, in this definition the West includes the middle what we would call the Middle East so everything from Sumeria and Iraq and Egypt all the way through to Europe is the West is Western Eurasia and the East is China and, and the regions and Japan and the regions uh, 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 around there. I India and others don't, don't, don't count in, in, in this particular uh, analysis, although it was equally significant through many parts of this history. Uh, so uh, looking at these two, two spheres, the Western sphere, including the Middle East and the Eastern sphere, you see that uh, uh, at the end of the last ice age, the social metabolism is around 300 watts uh, per, per capita, uh, the hunter-gatherer metabolism. And then the agricultural revolution started particularly in the Fertile Crescent and then moved to quite soon to, to the Nile Valley uh, and then uh, and so and so the, the the West in this definition began to rise up uh, in its social metabolism it uh, began s slightly later in the Yangtze uh, and moved on to the to the Yellow River Valleys and also sort of the Eastern social metabolism began to pick up a few thousand years behind uh, uh, this Western social metabolism and then the two began to rise but because of this lag in initial development the Eastern metabolism tended to lag behind uh, uh, for, for the equivalent stage in the West. And really by West here, until 2,000 years ago, we're really talking about the Middle East uh, uh, as, this, uh, uh, as, as, as this dominant socio-metabolic uh, force uh, in, in Eurasia. Uh, and it uh, uh, rose more rapidly with various transitions going on that I won't go into in detail here, uh, to a peak around uh, the time of the Roman Empire, ar around 2,000 years ago. And then something interesting happens. There seems to be a flattening out, and this is shown quite con convincingly uh, in, the, in the data in, in, in these analyses. And if let's zoom in on, on that period from around 2000 BC to 2000 AD. And uh, uh, firstly, we have the, the Roman Empire, and we see a, a, a peak of uh, uh, social metabolism in, metab in Western Eurasia around the time of the Roman Empire. And then we see it dips down. And, uh, and uh, uh, associated with the collapse of the Roman Empire and then the various successor states. And the proximal causes of that flattening out are, are, are well known. It could be barbarian invasions from the steppes. It could be plagues, uh, such as the Great Plague coming in. But what, uh, the, the, what this suggests is the underlying cause is a society that was unable to uh, absorb challenges, that it was hitting some sort of limit uh, 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 as a whole and was hitting, the, hitting barriers of capacity. Uh, if we look at the, uh, the, the, uh, on the Eastern context, the Han Dynasty uh, made, uh, was the most advanced society at that time, had a social metabolism lagging behind that of, 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 uh, uh, of the Roman Empire. But with the collapse of the Roman Empire, uh, uh, the, 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 the East managed to I increase its social metabolism because it didn't go through that period of collapse to the same, ex the same extent at the time and peaked at around the time of the Song Dynasty, around the 14th century, where it was on the brink of fossil fuels. They began to use coal, but not have this ultimate, ultimate uh, uh, industrial uh, transformation. But there was coal being used and burnt as a fuel at the time of the Song Dynasty. But then it also hit peaks and hit these same challenges of 
uh, invasions from the central steppes, plagues coming through. And uh, one thing, and this is really just a hypothesis, is that this looks like societies, both these cases look like societies that are hitting some sort of metabolic cap, uh, where they're not able to expand their energy use to absorb shocks to systems because they've hit regional boundaries in terms of the amount of energy flowing through. And one hypothesis, and it is purely hypothesis, is that under this agricultural framework of uh, uh, where all your energy is derived from land, an area of land, these societies were full. They were at capacity. And, there were, and, and societies that are near boundaries, whether they're regional boundaries or planetary boundaries, uh, uh, are societies that are more vulnerable to shocks that ca cascade through the system and have unpre uh, 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 unpredictable consequences. So a, a minor barbarian can incursion at the frontiers of the Roman Empire can end up causing the collapse of Rome uh, 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 over time. And, uh, uh, and so uh, this is the, the period, so, and one, one startling thing, and it startled me when I saw, saw these data, uh, is that at the 17th, by the 17th century, the, the social metabolism of the West was no higher than it was at the time of the Roman Empire, or was, uh, was slightly lower. lower. So the, uh, uh, this, this had long-term consequences. We normally tend to think of uh, the societal impacts of the collapse of Rome having, be, having been compensated for by the 11th or 12th centuries, but it seems like the in terms of the energy flow through those societies, they, they, they hadn't. And then, of course, we see a familiar pattern that, uh, for, for, for most things, ev everything began to change around the 18th century. And there's a surge of metabolism, initially in the West and soon after uh, in, in the East, uh, to a scale that goes, goes well, way off, uh, 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 off the... Uh, of the preceding value. So it seems like society that was hitting, his societies that were hitting their cap suddenly found a source of metabolic energy that enabled them to tra transcend those particular constraints and move into a, a new mode of energetic inflation. And of course, that is the, uh, the origin of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the, the, the transformation here, as Tim Lenton also pointed out in his lecture, is that rather than using land and production on land as our primary source of energy for our societies, we were able to use the, his the deep history energy of the biosphere, energy that the biosphere had captured from the sun millions of years ago and locked away beneath the ground as fossil fuels. Uh, the core of the Industrial Revolution was able to be able to tap this previously unavailable source of energy on large scales. And uh, you can see uh, this little animation gives you a little uh, uh, picture. Uh, this, this, this tracks uh, CO2 emissions or, 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 or is a, is a simulation of CO2 emissions around the world since the Industrial Revolution. But you can see it through the eyes of meta metabolism and see it as an as a image of metabolic activity uh, because the, the, this fossil fuel-based metabolism was so much higher than the agricultural metabolism. And you can see how human global metabolic activity changed from the 1750s. So it all began in this little island on the west coast of Eurasia uh, around uh, 1780. And you can see uh, that by 1800, really, uh, that is the dominant uh, uh, industrial metabolism. Then in the early 1800s, it begins to spread to, to Northern Europe and France, uh, uh, where, where the UK really lights up uh, in terms of the intensity of its industrial metabolism. Then it spreads to the east coast of North America by uh, 1900. By 1900, we're seeing Japan lighting up in the east, uh, uh, parts of South Asia. And then there's a bit of a hiatus, but then by 1950, suddenly we see this transformation, which sometimes is called the Great Acceleration, and large areas of the world start lighting up in terms of uh, one level CO2 emissions, but uh, another level, uh, the, the industrial metabolism, the social metabolism of these societies. So let, let's play that again, because I think it's, it's worth seeing it twice. Uh, and actually, when you look at this, uh, you, uh, look, at, look at it through the eyes of world history in the last few centuries, you can see where some of the dynamics that under, underlie world history over these centuries uh, is underpinned by industrial metabolism. You can see why Britain became such a dominant global empire with such, a, such, more, such more metabolism than other countries around that time. With France there, you can see the, the relative influence of the US increasing by about 1900 as a global power. You can see Germany increasing in metabolic power but not having the land area because that had already been seized by other countries, uh, uh, triggering the Great Wars of the 20th century, Japan lighting up with a similar challenge uh, uh, around 1950. And then you see the current geopolitics of the world and where, where power, and, and particularly the shift of metabolic power from this European North American axis to, to, to Asia as well as, a, as apparent uh, in these emissions. Now it's not a one-to-one -one thing because there are efficiencies of CO2 emissions. So, so I wouldn't say that CO2 is 
uh, an emissions is an indicator of the health of a society or the power of a society, but it is an indicator of the relative power and influence of societies over time. And so this, here we are in the modern world where we are uh, increasingly urbanized uh, uh, and increasingly high metabolic uh, uh, societies using vast amounts of energy. So if we look at uh, uh, the, uh, England or the UK or, and Northwestern Europe from space, we see this type of image with, uh, which captures both the amount of energy being expended, which is seen in these nightlights, but also the way our societies have become increasingly clustered into large towns and cities. So increasingly, as, a, uh, as well as a becoming more energetic, we're becoming a more clustered society. And this is because the energetic revolution enabled us to move away from being de dependent on land and local land. So under, under an agricultural society, we're dependent very much on the immediate land around us for uh, our energy supply. Moving to an industrial society, uh, Firstly, much of our energy no longer comes from the land. And secondly, we have so much spare energy that we can create efficient transport systems or other ways of getting our food supplies and other things into dense urban centres. So, so a city like London can have a vast hinterland, which is beyond Britain. It's a global hinterland to, which, which power provides its power and energy and food and, and, and raw materials. And so if you look at uh, uh, values, and these are values for England uh, uh, that I, I calculated here as an example. So the social metabolism of a typical, uh, well, an average person in England is around 8,000 watts. So already four times larger than that of an agricultural pre-industrial human. If you look at a, a North American, it's more like 12,000 watts so the per capita uh, uh, so social metabolism. And the population density in England is around 400 persons per square kilometre. Uh, and these are values for England, not, not the whole of the UK. Uh, but it is, uh, and so if we multiply, uh, oh, well, uh, we can also work out from, from an ecosystem model what the natural ecosystem metabolism of England would be, and it's around 200 gigawatts. So that's the amount of energy that flows through the biological systems of, of England. <coughs> and multiplying those two first two numbers together, we can get the extended social metabolism of England, and that's about 400 gigawatts. So about twice as much energy flows through the humans living in England as through the biosphere of, of, of this uh, country. Uh, so how is that possible? Well, the, the two reasons. Firstly, uh, only a fraction of our energy comes from the biosphere. So we have this independent source of energy, which is largely fossil fuels, which, uh, and hopefully increasingly is renewables and other sources of energy uh, as well. So we're not entirely dependent on the biosphere for our energy supply. And secondly, we also outsource uh, our our energy supply. So uh, uh, large, large parts of the energy and power that, that sustain us come from other parts of the world, uh, uh, whether it's uh, timber from other parts or oil palm from Southeast Asia and, uh, and uh, other features. Uh, and so in the case of somewhere like England, uh, the, the social metabolism is now 200% of ecosystem metabolism. If we do this same calculation for the continental uh, US, we would get uh, a smaller number, about 50% of ecosystem metabolism. But if you look at the East Coast or the West Coast, it's very similar to Western Europe in being these large numbers. It's just that there's large empty areas uh, in, in, the, in the middle that, that lower it down. So th with this industrial social metabolism, uh, this availability of new, new dense sources of fossil energy uh, uh, is a key feature of this, uh, of, of this uh, transition. Uh, and and these are also sources of energy that are not directly dependent on ecosystems for the first time in our history on a large scale. And so human use, energy use per capita increases eightfold. And uh, 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 e at one level you may expect, uh, well if we suddenly have this source of energy elsewhere, we, we can ease our pressure on the biosphere because we don't suddenly need to extract fuel wood from forests uh, for our energy supply. We can use fossil fuels. Uh, and at some level that works. So the intensity at which, say, we in Britain use our woodlands is much less than a society four or five centuries ago uh, would do it because we don't see the woodlands as a source of energy. Uh, we don't go there for collecting fuel wood and things. So, so it's in some ways, many of our, our woodlands are bouncing back from a much more intensive use and management in medieval periods. And many of you will go and see Whiteham Woods uh, uh, outside of Oxford next week and on a field trip. And you'll see this is the woodland that now is a conservation area that has a, a millennia of history of intensive use and, and, and management. Uh, but when we look at the global scale, actually, we see that this extra energy has actually 
rather than decreasing up the pressure on the biosphere, has increased the, the pressure on the biosphere because this energy enables uh, novel technologies to appear. So now we have the energy to uh, extract nitrogen from the air through the harbor Bosch process. So rather than being limited by nitrogen supply, we can actually capture this nitrogen that's abundant around us in the air, but is en energetically very difficult to extract into a form that, that life can use. And, and, but, but now we have abundant energy that, that, that we can do that. We can also build complex transportation networks so we can cast roads across the, uh, North America or now this century across the Amazon and previously remote areas and uh, uh, connect them uh, because we have this abundant energy and link previously remote regions of the biosphere to these centers of industrial metabolism. And also it, uh, 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 urban centers with high population density are favored because they're, they're, these are areas that are, uh, where exchange uh, and interchange are, are possible and we've, uh, we're, we've been freed from this dependence on local land supply for, 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 our, for our food supply. And this transition, it's important to remember, is still underway. Uh, uh, just about two-thirds of humanity, roughly, is still agricultural or peri-agricultural in, in, in peri-urban -ur areas. So it's certainly uh, uh, much of the world is still uh, undergoing this transition. And particularly in the last few decades, we've seen huge parts of, of the world undergoing this uh, agricultural to in industrial transition. But uh, as well as having a variety of benefits for humanity, there are environmental consequences. Because, uh, and partially this is because its energy supply is powered largely by the fossil biosphere. Uh, and, uh, and that creates waste products, in particular carbon dioxide is the most well known of those. And that's uh, at an extent that's beginning to alter the, the, the natural biogeochemical cycling and the climatic conditions of the planet. Uh, 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 gen more generally, this increased metabolism has just increased our ability to transform the environment around us in various ways and have the capacity to transform it uh, and to colonize previously remote areas of the biosphere, so like tropical forests that were previously were too difficult to convert in a, in, a, uh, in a major way because the natural metabolism was so high compared to human metabolism. Suddenly it is possible to transform them, to build roads to these, uh, and maintain roads through these difficult areas. And uh, also it's greatly increased our, increased our demand for resources. And f for example, uh, key biogeochemical components such as nitrogen and phosphorus sort of that feed into to our, our food system. And, there's a, uh, and it also increased our demand for land. Uh, to, to, as our population has grown, our demands have grown, leaving less space for other components of the biosphere, our fellow species, uh, citizens of, of, of this planet. So... Uh, now let's jump by, back to Kleiber's law again for, for a second uh, and, uh, 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 and, and, and look at uh, our extended metabolism in the context of uh, Kleiber's law. So here's a plot that you've seen in various forms earlier on that the metabolism of an of a organism uh, scales on log scales, scales to body mass to this three quarters power law. And now we can ask this question, well, n we've been talking about social metabolism, so we're more than simply our biological metabolism. And how big, if, if, or if we converted all our social metabolism into biological metabolism, how big would we have to be to have, the, uh, to have the same biological metabolism that we have as an extended social metabolism now? So we can ask this question. If we were hunter-gatherers, uh, we'd only be a little bit larger than a, than, a, than a human because we don't have much of a social metabolism. Uh, so uh, uh, we're there. If we're farmers, uh, pre-industrial farmers, we have a metabolism of around 2,000 what? So that's about the biological metabolism of a rhino. So uh, think of a farming society as uh, there's all these rhinos roaming around the landscape, transforming the landscape. And if we look at a modern, an average uh, 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 modern industrial person, we have, we have the metabolism that roughly the same of, as a, of an elephant uh, or a, a, a ten-time primate or a North American has, has, has a, on average a, a larger industrial metabolism. So what we're looking at is a uh, yeah, so the average industrial human has a resource consumption of a 15-ton primate in terms of the energy that needs to flow through that human to maintain them in their modern industrial lifestyle. And in North America, it extends to a 30-ton 30 30 primate. So if you want a new perspective on, on our impacts on the planet, imagine England as a con or the UK as a country of 65 million 15-ton primates ro roaming the landscape, transforming the landscape. And you understand why we have a significant impact on the planet. And uh, North America has 300 million, 330-ton primates. And of course, these primates this large exist only in fiction. And, 
And, uh, but imagine a landscape of 300 million King, King Kongs roaming through, uh, through the landscape. And you can understand how we are, how our metabolism is transforming the environment and our demand for resources and our main maintenance of not only high populations, but also highly demanding populations in terms of resources. And uh, some other aspects of it. Met metabolic theory is great because you can just plot something against another and then you come up with interesting ideas and speculations. But one thing you can do is then uh, look at uh, per capita power consumption, this, this socio-metabolism, and plot it against fertility rate. And we've heard a lot about the demographic transition and how as societies become more prosperous, the fertility rate uh, tends, to, tends to drop. Uh, so if we, before we get onto that, if we just look at purely a biological metabolism, we see a, a broad pattern that the more expense, the more power consumption there is per capita, the more expensive it is to, uh, to build and maintain offspring, the lower the annual fertility rate. So uh, if it's very cheap to make lots of offspring, you have lots of offspring. If it's expensive, you tend to have few. And if you look at uh, wild primates here, you see that this pattern is maintained at, at a lower level. There's a variety of reasons for that, but particularly with the more complex primates, you, you see a similar pattern. And if you look at uh, 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 human society, so hunter-gatherers uh, are the, uh, just trying, trying to get my scale there, I can't see the squares, hunter-gatherer societies around here, uh, and uh, pre-agricultural, pre-industrial agri agricultural societies are the triangles, which are about there and uh, nation, modern nation states are there. And you see that they fit, they broadly, there's a lot of variations, so you have to have some caveats about it, but you see that they broadly fit. And uh, having just raised two children to, to teenagers now, I, I, can understand, I can understand this graph and sympathize with it. Essentially, modern industrial uh, humans are expensive to raise. There's, lots of uh, there's a wider energetic consumption merely than feeding the biological metabolism of that child uh, involved in making those childs successful integrated parts of society and, and, uh, and so if you think of your children not not as a uh, 50 kilogram or 40 kilogram adults but as 15 ton primates you understand why you only have one or two of them when in, in an advanced industrial <laughs> society uh, and uh, 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 associated uh, 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 typically. So, so th th this gives you a little insight into this transition that the cost of raising uh, 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 com more complex, metabolically demanding individuals when they're under the socio-metabolic in in context uh, uh, tends, to, tends to decrease average fertility rates in society. And, uh, and it is important to, uh, uh, in the context of our discussions about the Anthropocene, to realize that the Anthropocene is a turbulent time. There's a lot of changes going on, a lot of challenges that we face as a global society. But it has brought a lot and is continuing to bring a lot of good to much of humanity. And sometimes uh, uh, in, in, in looking at the challenges we face, we forget these transformations that are, have occurred and are continuing to occur uh, <coughs> around the world. How life expectancy has increased from around 30 a century, just over a century ago globally to around 60 or 70 now. How child mortality rates have plummeted uh, in, in, the, in these uh, uh, societies so that now the natural expectation is that we will see our children live to adulthood and that was completely not the expectation you would have had uh, a century ago or, or beyond and much of the world uh, still don't have that entirely have that have that uh, expectation and uh, and it brings global all the technology and global interconnectivity everyone here we are children of the Anthropocene you are here in a you've traveled around the world to be here to do a course in in, in, in the UK because you have the energetic metabolism or your societies have the metabolism to be enabled to send you from far reaches of the world uh, to, to work and inter to interchange and to collaborate and, and uh, develop both your individual careers but also societies. So there are many benefits to the degree of energy and connectivity uh, of society that we, that we mustn't lose track of when we face the real challenges that we face in, in the Anthropocene. So the forces that have brought the Anthropocene have brought much is, that is good to humanity as well as challenges. And uh, so one question we can ask is uh, how much of our metabolism is directly drawing from the biosphere? We've said that a, a fair part of this metabolism is, is coming through fossil fuels and from other energy sources. And uh, uh, some still come from the biosphere. And on a global scale, and Hubble in particular has looked at this since, to some extent, it seems to be about half of our metabolism. This is our biological metabolism, so this includes not just fuel for energy, but also uh, for food, uh, the, the direct consumption of biomass for food, about, uh, uh, and also the consumption of biomass by cattle and domesticates that we end up consuming, which is a very inefficient process. Uh, it's about 
about half of our metabolism globally still comes from the, uh, f from the biosphere and a half comes from, from other sources. So it still is an increasing footprint of influence on the natural uh, biosphere. Uh, and uh, one way of exploring this particular, this biospheric appropriation is through this metric uh, called the Human Appropriation of Net Primary Productivity, or HAMP for short. And this is defined as the fraction of the products of photosynthesis that end up being diverted to human use. And it was originally uh, originated by the ecologist Peter Vitusek in the 1980s. And it's, I find it a quite a conceptually useful uh, concept as it, as it's a common currency linking earth system science and biospheric processes with, with, with human activity. And uh, it's the, uh, uh, ha so how do we define a uh, HAMP? Uh, the, the way it's done is that uh, you have a natural potential vegetation of a region. So if we were here, it would be a, a temperate a forest that has a certain a potential uh, pr pr primary productivity, the amount of bias mass it produces in woods and flowers and fruits and roots per, per year. And then we replace that with actual, and, and at a landscape scale, with actual vegetation. And uh, what we've done in doing that is we, perhaps a part of the landscape is still semi-wild or still, still uh, 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 in proportion has, has its natural ecosystem there. Uh, and that, uh, that's, its e that's ecosystem productivity. And then uh, part of it is being used uh, by us, uh, transformed into agriculture. Off that agriculture, we use some of the products. We may use the grains uh, for, uh, for or the fruit. Uh, but there's a part of that that also ends up being unused, the, the, the below ground material or the waste material uh, 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 from that harvesting process. So the two concepts that we have to capture here, one is that by transforming this landscape from its potential to its actual landscape, we possibly have decreased the overall productivity of that landscape. In some cases, we increase it, and I'll get on to that later. But we probably have decreased the overall productivity of the landscape. And then in that landscape with diminished productivity, we're also harvesting part of that productivity for our own uh, direct consumption. And the human appropriation of NPP is the sum of those two terms. The, the part that comes from this transformation of the ecosystem and the part of the ecosystem that they're, they're, they're after harvesting and using for di direct consumption. And there's a nice review of this concept that's just come out this month in annual reviews in environment and resources. That, that's a nice synthesis of all the literature on, on this concept. Uh, and so if at a global level, we can, we can use ecosystem models and understanding to predict the potential net primary productivity of the biosphere. So if there were no humans, what the productivity of the biosphere uh, would, uh, uh, would uh, look like. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, this is this paper by Hubble and PNAS about, about seven years ago, or about five years ago, uh, that, that, that produced these maps, but there, there are more recent versions elsewhere. And what we can see is how much uh, how much has, and first in the top, how much has the net primary productivity of land uh, in, been transformed by humans? Uh, how different is it from the potential? And generally you see there are yellows and reds. So generally human activity has altered the primary productivity of that square kilometer of land by transforming it from a natural ecosystem to an agricultural system that is optimal for humanity but not optimal for those climatic conditions in, in terms of overall uh, productivity necessarily. There are some exceptions which are those blues that you see, the Nile, the Central Middle East, the Indus Valley, and some areas. And those are areas, to typically rivers in, in dry regions where irrigation, human introduction of irrigation has transformed the Nile from, uh, 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 made it a, a large area of high productivity, which previously wouldn't have had access to water because of the, the irrigation. And similarly with, with the Indus Valley. So the, the, the primary cause of those blues is water management. And, uh, <coughs> And, uh, and using water, water supply in, in arid areas. The other slight area of blue is uh, in northwestern Europe where the intensive use of fertilizers has pushed the, uh, uh, the productivity perhaps to slightly higher values than the natural uh, productivity uh, of, of those systems as well. You see the light blues over there. And so, the, uh, so using the metric that I described before, you can calculate the total human appropriation of NPP. And you see that there are areas of the world the big rainforest regions in particular, where human appropriation of NPP is still relatively small uh, uh, on, on the, on the continent-wide scale. Uh, there are areas where it's intermediary in these yellows uh, in particular, and the areas where it's very high. And uh, uh, these, these are the, the, the big agricultural belts of North America and uh, 
areas of, of Europe in particular, and in particular uh, old civilizations in Asia, China and India, where there's a long history of agricultural transformation on which the industrial transformation sits on top. So you've had the agricultural transformation had created very dense agricultural societies with very high populations, and then the transition to industrial societies has increased the, the, the intensity of use of those biosphere even more in those societies. And you see India in particular stands out as under these calculations having amongst the highest uh, uh, appropriation of net primary productivity from the systems because it has uh, uh, so such a high rural population density and, and East China uh, as well in that context. And so if you look at these figures at a global scale, just to get an, an estimate, uh, so the, uh, if the potential MPP is around, it's 100%, uh, the human-induced alteration of MPP is, ar is around uh, uh, 5% five, five in total, but the harvest, we harvest around 20% uh, of the, uh, the NPP off the biosphere uh, uh, for, for our use, prim primarily for agricultural use. And so the total human appropriation of NPP factoring in both this uh, transformation and reduction of NPP and then harvesting off that lower levels of NPP uh, is around 25 to 30%. And a number of different studies in the last few decades have used slightly different methods, but all, all come up with estimates uh, globally around 20 to 30% of NPP is appropriated. But as you saw here, with huge spatial variation, that number includes the Amazon and the central Congo with very low, almost zero levels of, of uh, hemp, uh, and places like India with, with, with values approaching 60 or, or, or 70%. And if you look by land use class and the contribution, you see that cropping, agricultural cropping, is a dominant, about 50% of global hemp is associated with cropping. Grazing land is around another 30%. Forestry is around another 10%. And the other things are, are, are smaller components. So it's really agriculture and pastoralism that are the dominant uh, consumers of, of primary productivity in terms of human usage. And so one, one question that uh, uh, immediately comes to mind, is there a, is there a maximum hemp? Uh, if, we're, if we're approaching, clearly if, you're, if we're approaching values around 100%, we're, we're, we're pulling out more from the biosphere than it is possible for the biosphere to produce. So there must be some ultimate thresholds on how high you can, you can push that, even with, uh, with intensification or with uh, improved fertilizer use. And uh, some areas, uh, there may be possibilities for intensification, but maybe are, uh, are at a uh, near maximum of local net appropriation of primary productivity from, from, from the ecosystem. And this encapsulates you know, why this concept is useful, that uh, uh, in the context of the Anthropocene, uh, as our influence grows, we're, we're hitting boundaries in terms of consumption, whether they're local consumption boundaries or global boundaries. And local boundaries, to some extent, can be hit offset by importing, embodying production from other areas to import into, uh, into areas. But, uh, but the global boundaries, obviously, we hit fundamental constraints. And I think this is one of the, the challenges that we face this century, is that our, as our metabolism starts expanding on to, to, to scales that are comparable to the natural life cycle processes of the planet, we are, it's inevitable that we're going to hit various boundaries in various dimensions. So if we look back at these figures again, we can see the, so the social metabolic history of all of Eurasia, or uh, the West and the East, uh, in these figures. And uh, uh, a gradual transition from the uh, hunter-gatherer through the agricultural transformations, some evidence of possibly some sort of capacity cap to these agricultural societies hit about 2,000 years ago, bouncing against this cap several times, and then a release from this metabolic cap with the, with the discovery of, uh, and use of fossil fuels to a, to, to a large extent. And now a period of metabolic inflation uh, that, that's rocketing up. And, uh, and this is something that we've become quite accustomed to in every aspect of our society and every aspect of our lives, that uh, uh, both at a local level in our society and at a global level, overall, there is development. There is increasing consumption and use of resources. And yet, when we look at the long picture, we see uh, it's unprecedented in, in human history. And uh, it is, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an abnormal phase. And it's inevitable that there has to be some sort of transition. How it occurs and when it occurs is something that is very much up for debate. But clearly, this is not a an infinite path into the future of, of, of endless uh, metabolic inflation uh, at, uh, at this rate. And so if we look at the, the global uh, biosphere in, in these calculations, uh, 
uh, so we can calculate the productivity of the land biosphere and it's around 150 terawatts. That's the amount of energy that flows through the, the biosphere, the land biosphere globally. And uh, so uh, globally we can estimate the population of humans and the pre-agricultural human extended metabolism was around 0.002% of the metabolism of the biosphere. And probably our metabolism was less than that of elephants at that time in, uh, at, at a global scale. Uh, and, uh, uh, and if we look at uh, the uh, extended metabolism pre of a pre-agricultural society, say the world at around 1700, uh, its metabolism was around 3 terawatts, which is about 2% of total biosphere energy. So significant in some areas, but uh, at a global scale, still relatively small. There were still vast areas of the biosphere that were relatively semi-wild, uh, moving to, to, to uh, their, their own sort of metabolic paths. And if we look at modern human extended metabolism, remember this is about half from the biosphere and half from non-biosphere sources, it's around 17% of the biosphere energy. And that's roughly the same as the total amount of energy that flows through the, the Amazon rainforest as biological energy. So all of humanity is, in terms of met metabolic energy, is equivalent to, 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 to the whole Amazon rainforest. And uh, if we now project forwards to the future, if we take a, a UNDP mid-range forecast of a population of around, I can't remember, I think about 10 billion in this, this prediction, uh, and development pathways uh, also built into it, uh, we're looking at a global metabolism of around 48 terawatts, which is around 32% uh, of, of the biosphere metabolism. If we aim for a global China in terms of metabolism, so every, where everybody on the planet has a metabolism equivalent to a modern Chinese person, which is significantly lower than most people in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this audience today. And we'd be looking at a, 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 a global metabolism of around 60 terawatts, or around 40% of, uh, of biosphere metabolism. And if we shoot for a global US, uh, we would have a global metabolism of around 180 terawatts uh, over the, the natural metabolism of the, of the biosphere. And so what this shows is that these aren't fundamental constraints because, as I said, it depends where our energy comes from. If it's largely solar if it's, uh, or, or renewable, uh, the, the pressures are different. But, it, but even it, taking away the energy use question, it does show us the, the, how, that we are a large force of biogeochemistry and metabolism and nature on the scale of the planet. And that's bound to have consequences uh, with the boundaries uh, that we hit, and whether it's about energy use or waste production uh, or, uh, uh, or, or any, any of the uh, other boundaries, they're bound to be there. And to, to, uh, once you see, I think, uh, see humanity through this metabolic lens, it's very hard not to take issues like climate change seriously. It, it's, uh, uh, it's like uh, putting a car exhaust into your living room and watching it pump up with CO2 and saying, well, we're not seeing effects now, so we'd be, we can't be decided about whether this is bad or good. It's inevitable that it's going to have consequences, and we have to learn to deal with those realistically and work out what they are. But certainly denying that they'll be, we'll be lucky and somehow the Earth will somehow magically find some process that will avoid pumping high amounts of waste gases into our, into our finite atmosphere, and not, that would not have consequences, is, is just a putting your head in the sand. Uh, so, uh, so just uh, uh, so, so from, from this part of the analysis, many pre-industrial societies uh, argument were full uh, prior to the industrial uh, uh, revolution within the constraints of the agricultural energy system. But then a technological uh, innovation uh, opened up access to previously unavailable energy, and that's the industrial revolution and the use of fossil fuels. And we are still in a period of metabolic inflation that we have come to regard as normal, but is there really only a few generations deep, even in, in, at its source here in Western Europe, and in most parts of the world is, is a generation deep at, at most. Uh, and a period is uh, uh, this period is likely to eventually, and some would argue it already is, hitting constraints of both resource supply and waste production, constrained by the size uh, of the planet system. And so a transition will almost certainly have to happen, whether it's desirable, in, in a more negative scenario or, or a more optimistic transition in, uh, in resource use and recycling of resources, there has to be a transition that the, the modus operandi of the last century or two and the models that we have uh, have, to, have to be transformed uh, for growth. So if we compare this, this, is, this uh, feeds on to those of you who saw Tim Lenton's talk last night. Uh, the, uh, 
the, the colonization of land by plants, one of the major transformations in Earth history, uh, increased uh, terrestrial energy use by around 100, 120% overall. So it, it greatly increased the amount of area of the, the Earth that could be used by biological energy and, uh, uh, and yeah, had this tran transformation. And Tim argued, and, and some of this evidence supports it, though, that the current Anthropocene is a similar era of transition where the total amount of energy available to the biosphere, if we consider ourselves fully, fully parts of the biosphere, but a different mode of being of the biosphere, the amount of energy available in the biosphere has again gone up, doubled in magnitude through this uh, uh, industrial transformation. And that's having consequences, many negative uh, and uh, uh, for other species and, and for, uh, for processes as well. But in terms of significance, these transformations that we're going through now are significant not only on the scale of human history, but on the scale of Earth history. They're comparable in significance to perhaps to the colonization of land by plants. So There's an argument that, that, that Tim was making yesterday. Uh, so uh, so these, the, both these innovations uh, were powered by increased access to solar en energy. So the colonization uh, of land by plants enabled all that energy that was falling onto land that's much more available but was restrained by water supply. Uh, all that energy uh, became available to the biosphere and the land form led to the formation of the land biosphere. We've been powered by uh, thus far largely by access to this deep time energy where the budget biosphere captured in the Carboniferous and other periods and locked into fossil fuels. And then we've been using that reserve uh, to, to, to power this transformation. And such reserves are, are probably transient and they need to be transient because they're having consequences in terms of waste production. And, and, but they have a utility if they enable access to a more sustainable high energy sources, whether it's solar or fusion or uh, other sources in the end if they're seen as a transition to a different energy source rather than in a, in a de endless dependency in themselves. So the final section of this lecture, I'm going to uh, now, now look, uh, take, a, take a case study of urban humanity. And this is interesting because urban systems are interesting in themselves and also because we are increasingly an urban global society. Uh, but also I think some, some of the insights that are emerging from the study of cities perhaps give us insights into into our global situation and predicament uh, as well. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're an increasingly uh, urban population, so it's sometime in the last decade it's quite likely uh, that uh, the, the, the population of the planet became more urban than rural. So there's a major transformation in, the, in what it means to be human. That we don't. Uh, similarly, in the same way that the Neolithic transformation transformed us from being nomadic bands to being village-based sedentary ba uh, societies, where we've gone from being village-based to being highly clustered urban societies. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there is a huge amount of spatial variation. Areas, many areas of the world, South America, uh, North America, Europe are immensely urban, around 90%. Other areas, such as Africa and parts of Asia, are, have much lower uh, urban populations, but are still rapidly undergoing that transformation uh, the, uh, in, in these decades, in, in this early 21st century such that by, by the end of the century, we can expect that almost all of this map will be, will, would be uh, uh, highly urbanized uh, 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 societies. And uh, so one question we can ask is that, uh, to what extent can we view cities as superorganisms? We, uh, we saw that termites, when you put a bunch of termites together, they have the same metabolism uh, as uh, some of the individual termites. They, they, they obey the sca same scaling laws. Can do cities obey the same scaling laws? Are we when we're in a city, metabolically the same as a simple sum of uh, all, our, all our individual uh, parts. And, but people have looked at this question, and uh, there are lots of ways of looking at it. Uh, you can do lots of studies of infrastructure and uh, uh, society and energy use, and uh, I'll show some of them in a moment. But one of the easiest ways to look at it is to just uh, start to look outside your window and count the speed at which people walk past your window and the rate of activity. And if you, anybody who's done that in London and done it in Oxford and done it in a sleepy village in rural Oxfordshire know that Londoners move much faster than people in Oxford. Oxford people move much faster than people in, in, a, in a village. And if you take it at the global scale, uh, scale as well. And somebody has actually done a formal analysis of this around the world. And, uh, and what you find is, yes, uh, walking speed scales with population size of the, of the, of the centre. And uh, uh, it's a, I think the scaling coefficient uh, uh, slightly above one is 1.0993. So 
and, uh, and uh, anybody who comes back from a day I find anyway as somebody who's a bit more of a small town person that a day in London you, you feel the frenzy of the activity so, so just intuitively from that you get a sense that larger we're not quite termites we don't slow down when we're in a large system if anything we seem to be speeding up when we're in a larger system than, we're, than, we're, than when we're in a, a smaller system so something's not quite right we're not quite behaving like termites should do and just to remind you this is what termites and ants do that uh, the total metabolism uh, which is the number of the individual metabolism multiplied by the population there scales roughly as is three quarter power law uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 the, to the mass of the colony but what we're, what we're saying now uh, is that if, if the rates of humans are faster in large cities then we'd expect this scaling law to be greater than one the slope to be greater than one so the larger the, the human super society the larger the rate of activity and so when we look at that uh, 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 so I showed you this and this is what we find there's more activity in larger cities than in, uh, in slower cities and you can look at a number of metrics uh, here so I've just plotted a few here and the scaling coefficient is this beta coefficient here and uh, firstly at the, start of the bottom there are a number of things that do scale to a three-quarters power law and things like things that to do with infrastructure the amount of road surface the number of electrical cables the number of gasoline stations or sales all those things scale to a three-quarter power law, things to do with supplying resources through the network, infrastructure for resources. There are other, there's another bunch of uh, metrics that scale roughly isometrically, one-to-one, -one with, with the size of the city. And these are things that are really simply individuals multiplying up to a larger term. So the total amount of housing, the total amount of employment, the total elect electricity consumption or water consumption, the, 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 those things seem to scale with the number of people living in those cities. And then there are things that seem to scale super linearly, uh, faster than one. And uh, there's some interesting ones there. You can see GDP and things you'd expect and electricity consumption. But you also see uh, crime rates or AIDS cases or bank deposits or the, number of, uh, super, the amount of super creative employment, whatever that is, uh, uh, is there. But there are many and the number of patents. So clearly, uh, faster cities, bigger cities tend to burn faster in terms of many aspects of their uh, of their. Uh, their social metabolism and this is why we cluster in cities people go to cities whether it's in Lagos or in London because there are opportunities there are potential to to interconnect to, to, to with a much wider net of people to, uh, to uh, there's, there's, uh, there's access to infrastructure and healthcare and education and many factors that drive people to cities be simply because they are uh, uh, moving so much faster uh, uh, the, uh, so, so, so cities get faster with increased size and, uh, and so Betancourt is a pioneer of this work on cities. He's, uh, his point, he's made this nice quote that cities are not like social organisms. They're more like stars, that the bigger they get, the more intensely they burn in, term, in terms of, of their energy, the same way the stars do. Uh, this was a paper in Science la uh, last year that, that uh, made this analogy. And, uh, but this has consequences. If, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a city... If a, if a society uh, slows down, the larger it gets. It's in there, there's a negative feedback there. It's inherently self-limiting. A termite society slows down, the larger the termite mound goes. You don't end up having an, an infinitely increasing demand of resources for that termite. There's a, there's a natural equilibrium there. If it's, uh, if it's uh, simply linear growth, uh, then you get a, a you, you can uh, model this. So if, if a society has sublinear scaling, a bit beta is less than one, you tend to have this sort of growth over time uh, in, the, in the population or the energy use of that society to some sort of asymptotic value, some, some value which is, say, a large termite mound. If something shows perfect linear relationships, so the bigger it gets, the, more the, the, it get, the, the activity stays in linearly proportion to the size, that's an exponential relationship. So you tend to have this growth over time with no obvious asymptote within the parameters that you set for that system. And if you have a super linear but beta greater than one you tend to get super linear growth which tends to under that simple parameters of that system as you have it tends to hit a singularity an infinite point of growth where you cannot uh, 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 the resource use is infinite uh, and you hit a boundary and of course that doesn't happen in practice because ultimately the system hits some sort of constraint you simply there's a resource supply constraint or an area constraint or or uh, or something that that limits that growth beyond that and uh, in this paper, Betancourt uh, uh, 
Uh, uh, this, this figure that I'm slightly out of order of number of super creatives. If you feel you're a super creative, this is how you scale with, with city size. Uh, so Libetengor applied this model to uh, uh, at first, first theoretically to look at the, 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 the rate of uh, growth of cities uh, over time and uh, argues that this, this, this pattern is what happens, that you have this sort of super exponential growth but ultimately you start hitting some sort of re resource supply constraint. And then cities, as well as being areas of ex super exponential res resource use, are, re are also areas of super exponential in innovation, whether it's technological innovation or governance innovation as well. And a governance innovation example would be public transport infrastructure, sewage infrastructure, energy supply infrastructure. And, uh, and so what happens is that the, an innovation tips it into a different growth curve that starts growing up, hits another resource boundary, uh, and then uh, uh, again another innovation comes along, tips it into another growth curve, hits another resource boundary, another innovation comes along. So you have this overall period of growth which is periods of super exponential growth hitting boundaries and innovation moving on to, on, to the, on to the next phase. But the boundaries between the necessity for those innovations gets smaller, uh, the time period becomes smaller and smaller over time. And uh, he tested this with the, the, the population, looking at data on the population growth, norc, growth rate of New York from 1800 to, uh, to 2000 and argued in this paper, some would say convincingly, others say it's still open, but uh, that there were periods of this growth, resource limitation, innovation, new growth, resource limitation, innovation, and new growth in the pattern at which cities grow uh, over time. And, uh, and so what this captures is this idea of a city being this constant competition between resource use and innovation and uh, and constantly uh, and both are things that are particularly prime in a city it, it is a center of con resource consumption but it's also a center of constant innovation in both uh, by innovation i do mean more than technological i do mean innovation in how societies govern themselves how they structure themselves uh, 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 as well and i think uh, we can take this as some sort of analogy for the, the situation we, fa we face as a global society, that we're particularly now uh, through these innovations, we, uh, we go through periods of resource consumption, hit a boundary as we did perhaps in post-Roman Europe uh, as well. Then an innovation comes along, pushes us into another other period of metabolic growth, but we hit other boundaries. And, uh, but there's a constant uh, competition between innovation and resource consumption. And there's no inevitability to it. There's no in inevitability that innovation will always uh, uh, the, optim the economic optimists would say that innovation will always pass the, uh, so the, uh, be there to meet the environmental challenge. The, perhaps the environmental negative viewpoint would say there's no certainty that innovation can always be there to, to get us out of danger. So, uh, uh, so to conclude, uh, uh, what, what insights does metabolism, does a metabolic viewpoint give us into sustainability science? Uh, Tapping into deep time solar energy has enabled human industrial metabolism uh, to ex expand to a scale comparable to the natural metabolism of the biosphere. And any 21st century transition uh, that takes into account the aspirations of much of humanity needs to find a solution to this high metabolic energy demand. Uh, the, uh, and just incidentally to the side, uh, given the constraints that we put on the biosphere simply for food supply, in my view, the use of land for energy in the form of biofuels is just a bad idea, as it would just greatly increase the pressures on the biosphere that are already high. Uh, so I would, uh, uh, biofuel to me you know, is, is a much further, worse option than even fossil fuels in terms of uh, our impacts on the planet. Uh, so uh, the, uh, so the, so perhaps the fundamental environmental challenge that encapsulates all the challenges we face and I would argue is perhaps what defines the Anthropocene as a concept for me is that our global human extended metabolism is of a similar size and is surpassing the natural metabol planetary metabolism. The details of what the percentages are you know, can be open to interpretation but this broad concept that we're of a size globally similar to the natural processes of the planet is, is something that, that, that I think encapsulates uh, this sense of the Anthropocene. And this leads to so many of the, uh, the challenges that we face in environmental change around resource depletion, over-harvesting, over -harvesting, uh, loss of other species, natural habitat loss, accumulation of metabolic waste products and atmospheric change, they can all be encapsulated as seen through this lens of the size of our metabolism compared to the, to the size of, of the, of the bio natural biosphere. So our challenge in the 21st century is to navigate a transition 
from endless rapid growth uh, to a sustainable global state, we'll still we'll constantly have challenges and in innovations in there, uh, uh, while providing well-being for humanity and a living space for the rest of the biosphere. And this will require innovation, this constant struggle between innovation and, uh, uh, and resource use, uh, both in technology and in, and in governance, and global governance in particular. So, and uh, thank you. So, uh, so this presentation is available online if you want the slides. So that, and uh, as I mentioned, this book chapter is also available online if you haven't got access to it. But uh, thank you. Okay, so I think we can take some questions if they are from the audience here, but I don't know if you're getting any questions coming in from our outside. So a couple. A couple, okay. We'll take, we'll, we'll take, let's, let's take a couple from the audience and we'll take a couple from, from online as well. Anybody got a question? It seems a bit that you, what you propose is, a, is the end of growth. Because it's an end to rapid growth. So how would you explain or how would you justify your, your idea or your insights to yeah, I would say the, some sort of boundary to this period of current rapid growth. Uh, and I think it's not something I propose. I think it's something that's happen going to happen because of the resource contains we face. And the challenge, I think, is whether we are prepared for it and try and navigate a transition that's good or whether we hit it in, in an unprepared way and hit lots of uh, unprepared for challenges and, and, and catastrophes. Uh, so uh, it doesn't mean that's the end of growth for all time. I don't think there's some sort of equilibrium that we'll reach as a global society that won't change over time. But if there are subsequent periods of growth, they may be using very different technological modes or uh, 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 other ways of, of innovation. But certainly this current period of inflation, which started two centuries ago, is hitting fundamental constraints. Uh, and I think we just have to recognize that and navigate a, a way through that, through, through those constraints. But I'm recognizing them as one thing. I think a significant part of the world doesn't recognize that those constraints are real yet as well. Okay. Um, you're talking about how uh, human consumption is reaching the limits of the natural and integrated metabolism. But can we also share that integrated metabolism with other organisms? And if so, um, do you have a sense of how much of that metabolism is already being used by existing ecosystems and other like plants? Yes, uh, well, every bit of the metabolism that we take away and appropriate is metabolism that's been taken away from other organisms, whether they're plants or animals. And, and uh, I don't have the detailed numbers on that, but, but essentially you, you can view the planetary metabolism as the metabolism uh, that about half of that flowed purely through <coughs> plants, another half of that flowed through the higher trophic levels, whether it's the detrit detritivores or other animals. And so as we're tapping into that, we're removing... Uh, that supply to, 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 to other creatures. And that's most obviously manifest as direct habitat loss. Uh, yeah, as, as, as a conservationist, that uh, we appropriate large areas of habitat for our own use, that limits the amount of habitat that would have been used by other ecosystems and other creatures. Okay. Uh, you talked about land and hand, and then you said that biofuels, just planting biofuels is, cannot be a good option for expansion of energy sources. But then, uh, then you talked about uh, renewable energy sources as well. And some renewable energy sources uh, say we require huge solar energy parks or say wind, en wind energy farms or probably nuclear power stations if you classify that as, uh, mm -hmm. as a renewable source. Yes. So how do you balance this paradox? Well, I, yeah, that's, that's what I think from this uh, metabolic perspective, I don't regard biofuel as a renewable energy source because it's renewable in terms of CO2 emissions, certainly, but in terms of its impact on, on the global planetary metabolism, it, it's a net negative o on that. So this perspective, I, I think it's, it's, you, could argue, you could debate about whether nuclear is renewable. I think you can debate whether biofuel is truly renewable from this Anthropocene uh, perspective. I'll take a couple online and then I'll come back to, to that. Do you have a, do you have a so couple? Just to add on to his last question, you had a question from Dave, Dave Ray, okay. who asked, are all biofuels bad? What about third generation biofuels such as algae, biodiesel? But I guess you would have to that. Yes, um, well, yeah, that, that was broad. I think uh, uh, there are certainly, there's an appropriate place for, uh, for appropriate sort of technologies that are relatively limited in their impact and also are using waste products from other processes that we use. And that's, a, that's a good thing. We're actually improving the efficiency and recycling of processes. What 
I think would be bad is converting large areas of the tropics to oil palm biofuel as a renewable source of energy or, or, or anything that increases our pressure on land uh, uh, that's already limited in terms of food supply uh, uh, as well. So that's where I, I, I have to think. I, I was too cavalier and just saying, well, uh, biofuels are bad. But I think some of these modes of thinking of, of large scale biofuels as, as a, a renewable way of powering our societies uh, is, is bad. Uh, I was actually, uh, I, I think the answer is a composite. And actually, the, one of the things is when I plotted, when I pulled out this data, which are in the appendix of this book by Ian Morris, and plotted them over time, I was actually surprised how much strong the evidence was that we were actually in some sort of Malthusian trap from about the uh, 2000, from, from the fall of the Roman Empire through to the Industrial Revolution, that societies were actually hit, hitting boundaries and... Uh, and therefore, that there was a reason why they were facing constant shocks and not able to absorb shocks, whether they're epidemics or whether they're uh, invasions from the Central Asian steppes. So I think we moved from a Malthusian world, world then. And actually, ironically, it was fossil fuels that liberated us into this, this Bosseropian sort of phase. But now, there's every possibility, like neither of those are inevitable final states. And there's every possibility that we, there may be newer Malthusian boundaries that, 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 that we hit at different stages. Uh, is it, uh, well, I'm not entirely sure whether we want to reduce our social metabolism because I think what cities are also uh, uh, our ultimate sources of innovation in many cases and actually many of the challenges that we face need innovation as solutions whether it's you know, governance innovations or techn technological innovations and so if we find a solution it is to still maintain that and it's possible maybe we're so interconnected that we don't need cities at some stage that maybe our virtual interconnection is so strong uh, and that is that, uh, but there, are, but there are, I'm not sure a more diffuse society would necessarily have a, a, a lower metabolic footprint. In some ways, cities are highly efficient places to store large numbers of humanity uh, in a way uh, because of the infrastructure efficiencies and many other things. Okay, so. Yes, yes. How do you actually really reduce that gap and, and how is it really affecting on a global scale? Yes, yeah. think, yes it's three quarters idea. Yeah, I, w I wasn't making too much of that particular three quarter rule. It was more to make the point that actually when you look at data, you find three quarter rules uh, all over the place. Uh, but it clearly shows that uh, you know, there's, a, there's, a broad, there's a broad correlation. So societies uh, that have high, uh, high GDP Tend to, tend to have high energy consumption on a global scale. So when you're comparing the United Arab Emirates with the Democratic Republic of Congo, they, they fall on that pattern. Interesting is why this slope averages around three quarters, but that, and that is an interesting puzzle, which I haven't got an easy answer to. But you see that there are huge deviations. There are societies that uh, have much higher energy consumption per capita GDP, and you can see what, what's emerging up there. Many of the Middle Eastern oil-rich societies, but also Eastern Europe, uh, come and then Russia come up on top. Other societies that, that come down at the bottom end, many of these very highly urbanized societies, such as Hong Kong, Japan, uh, 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 appear below that. So there's, there's a lot of space within that for the way societies choose to use their energy, choose to govern themselves. There's no metabolic determinism in there saying that if, you, if this is your GDP, you have to have this consumption rate. You can, there's, a, there's a, at least a factor of two or an order, possibly even an order, more than that, as a factor of five variation in the energy rate you can, a society can have, depending on how it organizes itself. Then, then why is it that the floor is not more or less used to actually tell that yeah, this is the GDP versus this is the capital? Yeah. Well, you can, see, you, can, you can see why it's not used. And this is a logarithmic scale. And even though you get this overall pattern, the deviations from that pattern, on an average, are huge. So it's not, a, it's not a very use. If you were trying to predict the energy consumption of Russia based on its per capita GDP, you'd be off by a 
factor of five based, uh, based, on, based on these uh, patterns. It's for Russia consumes five times more energy than its GDP would predict on the simple scaling patterns. Okay. Um, so I know that, um, at, for example, MIT, there are studies on uh, calculating the metabolism of cities, so looking at energy and water flows and all that. Um, ha have you come across research that looks at um, how much, for example, a path in a city would offset um, the energy um, consumption in a city, for instance? The offset in what sense? The, the, the um, Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand uh, uh, what you're getting at. So, so, the, so the park itself obviously would have a biological metabolism, a, a highly altered but a, but a biological metabolism, and the city would draw very little from the park or, uh, in, in terms of metabolism, but it would have its wider social metabolism that draws, draws from elsewhere. So uh, I mean in terms, I suppose, of the, the mean metabolism of that city, in terms of the people who live there, it means that there's, there's a significant biological metabolism in the city that makes it a more pleasant place to live uh, 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 in many ways. But I th the, the two, there's probably not much interaction energetically between the two, apart from an area of that city has been put aside for relatively natural metabolism. Uh, but, um, yeah, but, uh, yes. I would suspect not, uh, uh, because in the end, the metabolism of the city is the number of people that live in the city and the mean consumption they have for their, their wider lives. So, uh, uh, so if it meant that less people lived in that city, because the city was a finite size and the green spaces meant there was less people, then it would. But if it just meant that the city was bigger, but, I, but it managed to fold in green spaces in the city, it might make it a more pleasant place. So there are reasons to do that, but I don't think it would change the the overall energetics of that city in a big way. Hmm. Okay. Just a question. The slide about potentially in 2050 social metabolism being 120% of the land biosphere metabolism. Yes. Now, in my mind, that I'm trying to think that must be different from human appropriated net primary productivity. Yes. So yes. That with 120 then yes. Yeah. What's the difference between those two? Well, a key difference is that only a fraction of our metabolism comes from biosphere. A fraction still, uh, we said roughly half comes mainly from fossil fuels now. You know, we could imagine in an optimistic scenario it would come from renewables or so and solar or other things by then. So only in terms of our energy draw from the system, it's only a fraction of our, of our total metabolism. But in terms of our impact, it's our full metabolism is there to have our impact on the system in terms of transforming, transforming the system. That would be roughly, yes, our, our draw on the biosphere. Yeah. Depends on exactly what happens. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that uh, energy has to be put into innovation, and innovation comes in technology and governance, right? So how much energy would you suggest to put in technology, and, and how much energy in governance, in a sense, so that to prioritize this move forward? So that uh, I'm not sure I'm, I'm qualified or even able to quantify uh, those things, but... Uh, uh, but, I, but, but uh, all I would say is that I think the innovations are both are parallel. I think many of the challenges we face at the moment are around governance. That, uh, and the, the climate change is one example of, of that, how difficult it is for a world full of many players to come to a, a, a common framework for, for, for reducing, recognizing that this is a problem, coming up with a, one where you trust enough of your you know, other governments enough to, to have a common strat pathway uh, for, for reduction. So uh, many of the challenges we're facing are now transboundary, but our governance structures are still largely national. And that's one of the, the problems of how we do we come up with effective structures that, that work on that scale. But I think we also face, I don't know, some other, within the subnational scale, ways of how do cities best organize themselves and run themselves? How do societies best organize their infrastructure uh, as well? But, so I, I wouldn't put a number on it, but I would say that both are important. I think 
we, we, shall, we, we can't dismiss the importance of technology helping us out, but we also need to have a, a governance solutions as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting question, and I think you know part of, part of the challenge is a, a would that occur as a resource, and b would <coughs> would we innovate away from that? No, not, not, it's not necessarily an entirely positive way, but if we suddenly move to shale gas and liquefied gas as, as an alternative source, uh, uh, but certainly that as a peak oil is one if it occurs, or is one of the examples that our consumption rates are are, are so high that we hit boundaries, and whether it's in terms of in that case, a resource extraction boundary, or many would argue that actually will, with fossil fuels, we'll hit, hit the waste boundary at the, uh, much sooner than we'll hit the resource supply boundary uh, in terms of consumption. Okay, any more? Nothing else? Okay. Well, I think uh, it's been a long two hours, so uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.